so the E2O Plus is here, and uh, of course, there's lots on that and more that we'd like to discuss with uh, Mr. Pavan Goenka. He's right here, and uh, good to see you. It's always nice, Pavan, and it's been a while, I think, since we last had you on the show, so thanks for speaking to us. Uh, this is something that for some people, I think, is a surprise, but for some is not. Um, big intent behind bringing us the bigger one? Well, the big intent uh, basically is to bring a four-door. Uh, in uh, India, a two-door has its own limitations in terms of customer uh, acceptance of a two-door. Uh, and therefore, four-door was a must to complete our offering of what I would call an entry-level uh, portfolio of electric vehicles. So with the E2O Plus, which is a four-door and E2O two-door and the E-Supro passenger and the E-Supro van and the E-Verito, I think we have now everything that we need in the entry-level portfolio of electric vehicles. When we talk about entry level, of course, there's always this question mark on the price and there's always then talk of incentives, etc. Um, are we now at a different point than we, we were when the first E2O arrived? Yes, definitely. I think uh, uh, when we had the first E2O, there was no farmer benefit. And in fact, uh, to some extent, E2O got impacted negatively because of that. Because when we had started working on it, there were incentives. But when we launched, there were not. Uh, so now that farmer is firmly in place, now that many state governments have announced <coughs> for the incentive for uh, electric vehicles, uh, at least in the more aggressive states like Delhi, uh, the cost of buying a E2O Plus is not much different than buying a similar size automatic uh, petrol or diesel vehicle. Right? And when you add it to it, the saving that you get in uh, fuel cost and maintenance cost, uh, even to the wallet, uh, the electric vehicles are better than uh, than, than, than a hatchback. Uh, so you don't have to be an environmentally uh, conscious person uh, to justify buying electric vehicle. It is justified even without that. Of course, electric vehicle has its own sort of disadvantage and advantage that we are all aware of, and one has to weigh those off uh, and uh, come to a conclusion that electric vehicle is for me. Well, this kind of an idea to start becoming mainstream, uh, and we've always talked about that sort of utopian point where suddenly things will change. Um, What's it going to take? What's that tipping point? Is it just a whole lot more models? Should we see a lot of manufacturers doing uh, this? I think uh, I think clearly having a whole lot more, more models help because then there's more marketing of electric vehicles in general and people become more comfortable with electric vehicles. Because right now with one company, one OEM, only that much we can do in terms of making people aware of the virtues of electric vehicles and sort of uh, taking away the, the sort of myths about why electric vehicle is not for me. So when more people come in, obviously this will become 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 better. And more people coming in doesn't mean more competition because we're talking of 50, 100 a month. So there, it's not a question of taking away from that. More people will mean more new customers coming into it. So I'm actually waiting for that. Uh, that uh, Asok Lane has recently announced about the electric bus. That's a good, good news. And I'm sure more, uh, all OEMs must be working on it. And they'll start coming out, coming out soon. But what it will take, I think, is uh, more positive experience sharing uh, of customers uh, with uh, fellow uh, potential customers. Uh, there is a fairly large overstated constraint or concern that comes up on the range uh, and on charging infrastructure. Both are needed, but I think uh, they are overstated because uh, if you look at the range of 110 kilometer, for any city commute, uh, for any personal owner, 110 kilometer is okay 364 out of 365 days. For that one day, one might have to take a taxi, but for 364 out of 365 days, it's okay. Similarly, charging, given that the E2O charges a normal power outlet, uh, charging at home or in office is not a problem at all. <clears throat> and more and more, we're getting malls and uh, uh, airports to put in uh, sort of charging stations for normal charging. The only place we need infrastructure is for fast charging and that as I said is needed only in a situation where you need to go more than 100 kilometers in a day which happens very rarely. So I think they are real concerns but overstated. I do agree with you actually on that and because we get a lot of these queries as well. Now the other thing that we've started to see and I know that we're, we're sort of talking apples and oranges, um, the, this whole influx of slightly premium uh, plug-in hybrids. At least the fact that that's happening, do you think that it could have a trickle-down effect? I mean, also because they're not just conventional hybrids, but you know, you're seeing an actual plug as well. Well, uh, yes, I mean, if you look at the, uh, the progression, <coughs> one can talk about mild hybrid to a strong hybrid to a plug-in hybrid 
to a pure bank, right? And this is sort of, uh, uh, one could say that's the progression that should happen. We have jumped from all the hybrids directly to BEV uh, because we believe that if you're looking for the ultimate clean vehicle, that's battery operated. Any kind of hybrid would always have some, some emissions, some pollution, uh, and therefore we have focused on this technology. And given that these technologies take time to get accepted, and given that there is fairly significant investment that uh, OEM has to make in these technologies, we cannot be sort of doing everything. We have to uh, choose our bets, and we have chosen uh, to bet on uh, electric vehicles, and uh, we continue with that. No, but just that they are coming in and that people are starting to use the whole plug-in idea, do you think that will just sort of have a good positive rub off on pure electrics as well? So see, plug-in hybrid has an advantage of not having the range anxiety. Uh, that's the big advantage that plug-in hybrids have, uh, because with that you can have almost as much range as you would in any any, any other car, uh, and and therefore uh, that has that advantage. But the disadvantage is that uh, uh, it's it's not as green as a BEV, uh, and then one can argue what makes more sense. And an electric vehicle, uh, one thing that we are finding here, which perhaps doesn't get noticed uh, as much, uh, is that making a connected car becomes a natural electric vehicle. And I think I can claim that in India today, in any price range, any price range, this is the most connected car that you can buy. The kind of features that we have here. Because it's electric and therefore, everything sort of comes in very easily for us, the controlling the, uh, the, the remote control, remote diagnosis, uh, uh, sending out information to the uh, to the customer. Like, for example, one of the cute features that we have is that if you close your, uh, shut your door and start moving towards your house and haven't locked it, you'll get SMS saying you haven't locked your car. <laughs> I have to say that a lot of uh, really high-end cars have these kind of apps nowadays, so you're right, it is probably a, something a lot of people don't know. Um, We've seen now that you know you've moved from just like you said from just the E2O to now having this sort of portfolio, which means different kinds of vehicle sizes, weights. Um, are you ready to start to look at maybe an electric application on some of your SUVs? And what about Sangyong? I mean, is Sangyong interested in taking some of this from you now, uh, so, given uh, its very, demands. Very interestingly, uh, uh, just this week I have come back from my Sangyong visit, uh, and we have talked about how we can. Uh, uh, Sort of work together on electric vehicles and hybrid vehicles for that matter. Uh, both Sangyong and Mahindra have uh, plans to take it beyond what we have done, which is entry level, uh, and see if some of the SUVs that we have can uh, can be electrified. And but it will not happen with this powertrain. This powertrain of uh, 30 kilowatt is not enough for a SUV, which is you know 13, 1400 kilo. This vehicle is less than 1000 kilo. Uh, so we are working on a new power trend right now, uh, Mahindra Electric Cream is working on it and we are looking to see whether it can be uh, used both by Mahindra and Sangyo. This is not made yet, but we are looking at it. But, but that works happening in Bangalore, it's happening here. Happening in Bangalore. Um, why I ask that question is because in that range where now the new Rexon is going to come, we saw it as a concept uh, in, in Paris, um, that buyer is suddenly actively looking for either plug-in, hybrid or even electric. Uh, but with that vehicle size. So not from an Indian context so much, but from other markets. Uh, that, that vehicle, uh, to make it pure electric, will probably take a uh, lot of battery power because that's a 2,000 kg plus, uh, plus, plus battery. So it, it probably is not right for electric right now. But some of the mid-range SUVs that we have, we could potentially look at those becoming electric. So a car like a Tivoli is more suited to it, you think, than... A car like Tivoli will be more suited to it than a car like Y400. Is that, a, is that an active feedback you're getting from your dealers across the world? Is that something that a lot of customers are now starting to ask for? Not really, uh, not really. I don't, I don't think the customers coming in and asking for electric vehicle right now. They're customers who are <coughs> looking at available electric vehicle, but nobody's uh, coming and saying, why don't you have an electric vehicle? I think that is still a few years away. All right, fair enough. So one last thing then. Um, we always talk about this in the context of these cars, but um, You've had a certain experience now with the uh, E2O, you've also had the e where E2O come in, and you know, all the challenges have been sort of well understood and, and, and I think you've found certain solutions as well. Where does it go from here? I mean, I'm not expecting you to tell me that there's going to be this massive jump in volume anytime soon, but even if it's a gradual growth, is that going to start to become something really sort of significant within the group for you? 
Uh, will it become significant within the group in terms of the revenue that will generate from electric vehicle? It will take few years. I don't think it's going to happen in the short term. Okay, uh, because right now we are selling 75, 80 vehicles a month. Even it becomes 10 times. Uh, that's thousand, less than thousand vehicles a month, which is only two percent of a total sale, two and a half percent. So it won't become significant for times to come, for some time to come. Uh, but it will become important uh, because EV, as we have always said is not just about growing our volume or growing our revenue. It is about a uh, mission that we have of can Mahindra lead the way in India to make India a leader in electric vehicles. And I have said, I've been saying for the last five or six years that if we all put our collective effort on it, uh, and when I say all, I include OEMs, suppliers, government of India, the media, and the customers. If we all put our collective efforts on it, then India can become a leader in electric vehicle uses. Uh, can, can become electric vehicle use. And for India, it's very good uh, because India has a pollution problem in most of our uh, metro cities. Uh, and there is a misnomer that India is a power shortage country. How can we afford electric vehicles? I think it's a misnomer. Some, somebody should do math to see even if you have 10% of the vehicles on electric, on electric, you won't even make a dent on the power uses that you have. So there are many of these myths floating around, but but I, I think I think the time for electric vehicles will come. Okay, and I say this with certainty. What I cannot say with certainty whether the time has come now, whether it will be another two years, five years, ten years that will happen, but it will come for sure because India cannot afford not to have a large fleet of electric vehicles. We will choke. <laughs> I know I said that was the last question, but something you said triggers uh, an idea or a thought. Um, when you talk about this, the fact that for you as, as, a, as a company, it's not about you know, just profitability or volume sales, uh, but you're still putting money behind the research and you're developing newer power trains. Uh, would you be looking at customers outside the group to say that, look, here's the technology, yeah. we have it. And you know, your technology, I, I dare say, is more cost effective than so many others. Yes, we are, definitely. Because uh, again, I go back to our objective. Our objective is not necessarily to sell 100,000 Mahindra electric vehicle but to have 100,000 electric vehicles in India, right? If we can help that, uh, if we can enable that by selling a powertrain to another OEM, we are more than happy to do it. Doesn't it doesn't have to be in India? It doesn't have to be in India. It doesn't have to be in India. But what we, what we have done so for now is that Mahindra Electric, uh, which is the new name for Mahindra Reva, uh, has kind of become a powertrain supplier. Okay? So E-Varito, E-Supro are Mahindra products. We buy the powertrain from Mahindra Electric and we manufacture the vehicle in Mahindra products. This is the only Mahindra Electric product. Right? Uh, and, and right now we are supplying only to Mahindra. Tomorrow if another OEM comes and wants to do a contract with us to supply from Mahindra Electric with them, we will do it. Now, are you open to it or would you actively seek that as a business uh, for the company? We will actively seek that as a business. Yes. Um, so 100,000 powertrains when you say, is that is that just an example, that's, that's a figure? That or do you think that's a good figure to get the company's See, 100, profitability? 100,000 powertrains would mean uh, roughly about 4% uh, of uh, total market that India has. 4% is the minimum that one has to target. I mean, 100,000 is not even enough. So if we did 100,000 and there are four more players did 100,000 each, uh, then, and, and this will happen say five years from now, by then we'll have four million vehicles. So that makes it about 10%. And 10% is an interesting number. And that's what I would hope that India will get to 10 years from now, to have 10% of its fleet, uh, new, new fleet on electric vehicles. You know my thoughts on this, so I hope you're right. I hope it happens sooner. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Bob. All right, thanks. Thank you.